Hey, my name is Matt, and for a while now, I've been trying to adapt and overcome issues I faced while learning the Godot game engine. If you've seen any of my previous videos on Godot, you'll know that after over 10 years of using Unity, I was a bit disappointed to learn that Godot fell short by comparison in a few key areas. One of those areas is the way that you debug your project while the game is running. If you want to see some of the other roadblocks I faced while picking up Godot, feel free to check out this video. Or don't. I'm not the arbiter of your schedule. Now, I'm not one to back down from a technological challenge, so instead of working around these limitations or giving up on the engine, I decided to simply bend Godot to my will by creating pull requests which help bridge this gap. By doing so, I'm hoping to not only make my life easier when building projects with the engine, but also improve the experience for the general community who could benefit from this investigation. Gathering a consensus on a topic, implementing it, and keeping pull requests up to date is a lot of work which you essentially have to do for free, and even then your PR is not guaranteed to be accepted. But I chose to tackle this problem regardless, and I'm hoping it pays off. As of recording this video, the first PR is still waiting to be merged, so while I don't want to get your hopes up, there's a good chance it could be included in Godot 4.6 and beyond. Okay, great, but what exactly are the debugging issues that I ran into, and how did I fix it? That's what we're going to dive into today. So strap yourself in and prepare to get launched into the future of live debugging in Godot. Before I talk about the purpose of these features, it would be helpful to clarify what I mean by debugging in this context. Of course, there's classic script debugging, which happens from the console or with breakpoints. But when working on a game that the player interacts with in real time, it can be helpful to observe the state of the game world and edit it while the game is running with the same tools that were used to create it. Unity provides a clean debugging experience by basically running the game inside the editor itself and keeping the editor tools active while you play in a small panel. To be more specific, I'll lay out three essential tasks that I find very helpful when debugging a game. Number one the ability to play the game from the player's perspective while viewing the world from a debug camera at the same time. So here in Unity, I can run around my level and also see what the player is doing from this scene view. It's especially helpful when you need to verify that an event which is normally off-screen from the player camera occurs correctly. Like for example, another character moving to the correct position when the player interacts with some point of interest. Number two. The ability to click on and manipulate objects present in the game world using on-screen gizmos. In Unity, the exact same transformation and inspector tools that you use in edit mode are available while the game is running too. This means at any point I can pause, click on an object to select it, move it to a new position, and immediately test how the game would play if that object was moved all from the same two panels. And number three, the ability to view and edit script variables and object properties. This means I can do something like change the character's speed by tweaking an exposed parameter and instantly see the results. This is an absolutely vital part of debugging since it allows me to verify numbers or other pieces of data that were calculated at runtime through some game mechanic, even if they aren't displayed to the player in any form. Of course, these three tasks aren't the end of the story when it comes to game debugging. There's still a lot to gain from performance profiling, visualization tools, and custom editor scripts that improve the process of testing and fixing bugs. But I think these three ideas are the most essential and straightforward ways that a developer can interact with their project to verify that it's behaving as expected. And while Unity's tools aren't perfect, I think they provide a very intuitive experience that makes it easy to experiment while playing. Speaking of experiments, if the game you're seeing on screen looks interesting, why not try it out on Steam? I just released Burden of Truth, an Ace Attorney inspired mystery game on Steam last month, and I'd love for more people to check it out. I worked for over a year on this thing, writing the script, creating 3D models, and programming game systems, so this is a huge accomplishment, and I'm so excited to finally release it for all of you to play. Also, the official soundtrack is now available, and you're hearing that music play right now in the background, so I hope you like it. Well, that was a bit of a shameless plug, but as an independent game developer, I have to take every opportunity I can to show off my work, and I genuinely hope viewers like you find it cool. But with that out of the way, let's move on to the history of Godot's toolset. Before Godot 4.4 released, debugging your game meant compiling and running the project in a standalone window, separate from the editor and using the remote tab to select and manipulate nodes at runtime. 
Right off the bat, I think Godot started off handling task number three pretty well. When you have an object selected in the remote tab, you can freely manipulate script data and toggle properties like visibility and processing. This is pretty neat, though one critique I have is that the live data doesn't quite display the same way as the regular inspector layout, which is a bit unflattering, but not the end of the world. The bigger problem with this approach is that you had to work with an entirely separate application and couldn't view the world from a debug camera unless you enabled the camera override button. This allowed you to pan around in the scene view and force that camera transform within the running game, but that meant you couldn't play the game and use the debug camera at the same time. It also meant that you had to move the camera from a view that may not represent the live game world at all. For example, if you had a procedurally generated world, you'd be moving your camera around in empty space, trying to guess where all the important stuff is located. That's not very intuitive to work with. Additionally, you couldn't click on objects in the actual game world and could only manipulate the beginning state of the game from the scene view. But if objects spawned at runtime, there's no way to see or move them with gizmos. To try to address these issues, a proposal was created on GitHub which detailed a new game tab that would finally let you play the game from the editor and see the runtime state from the same window as your development tools. A lot of ideas floated around at the time, and there were a lot of opinions and requests to take a certain direction in the implementation. But in the end, a path was chosen, and the game view was born. In late 2024, this landmark pull request by Yeldhem Dev finally added the core play and editor functionality to Godot. The feature was a bit rudimentary at first, but the main idea was there, working in Windows and ready to use. The way it works is basically taking the window that appears when you build the game and embedding that into the editor window using operating system features. So fundamentally, we're kind of working with the same build process under the hood, but it just looks like the game window is part of your main editor window. This has benefits already, one being that you don't need to tab between windows to work in the engine and play the game. It can all happen in this one view, which is really nice for single monitor users. But there are some clear downsides to this approach. Because we're just displaying what's rendered in the game window, the editor has no better understanding of the runtime objects and still doesn't let you manipulate them using the same gizmos present in the scene view. This means point two still has a ways to go. Now, the remote tab is still functional and there's a neat selection system built into the game view, which lets you automatically select an item from the remote hierarchy. This is really cool and definitely preferable to the old way. But if we want to let the user manipulate nodes at runtime visually, we're going to need to re-implement the gizmo tools and then inject them into the game process itself. It's all possible, but a lot more work is needed to get this kind of thing up and running. As a side tangent, one of the directions I would have preferred to go when reading about the original proposal was actually letting the game process run inside of the editor. Well, this has a more complicated setup and more drastic underlying change, it eliminates all of the embedding issues that we're facing now and would automatically work on all platforms, unlike the current method, which can lag behind on systems like Mac, where there isn't a clear initial embedding strategy. An approach like this would also make manipulating the game at runtime viable from the get-go, because the scene view could be loaded with runtime objects, and we'd get a free debugging camera in the process. I'm simplifying a lot of stuff here, and I'm aware it isn't as easy as I'm making it sound. I'm also aware of potential downsides to this approach, including the fact that the game code could interfere with the stability of the editor. But with enough time and manpower, I believe that these issues could be addressed or at least minimized. Overall though, I think it would have created a stronger foundation to build upon for the future of the engine if we had taken this route, and it is a bit of a shame that something like this won't be realized. But there's little point talking about what could have been. A technological path was chosen, and the three essential tasks that I mentioned earlier are still doable with embedding. Even if I don't prefer this approach, it's not a bad option, and I can understand why it was preferable to get something working more quickly. So let's take this implementation as far as it can go by thinking about point one, playing the game while viewing it from a debug perspective. Currently, the game tab allows you to click on this camera override button and see the game world from a perspective of your choosing. However, this interrupts the player's view. If we detach the window and try to play while looking at the scene view, well, we're not looking at the runtime version of the game anymore, and we're kind of back to square one. 
I've seen some cool tricks people have done with tool scripts that allow them to preview game systems while the game isn't running, but we're in the business of improving the ease of use of the engine automatically for everyone, requiring as little code as possible to debugging your game. So what can we do about that? Enter the dual screen game view. I created a pull request that hopefully sets us down the path of knocking point one out of the park. Before I explain how I did this, let's first look at the core idea behind this new feature and how it can improve debugging your game. One thing I noticed while playing around with the game view is that additional game windows aren't embedded. Only the main window is. The main window, in case you didn't know, is basically the first default window that is generated when you build your game. But if you had a game with two important windows, like one for viewing the world and one that acts as an interface, you have no way to choose which one you actually want to see in the editor. And then I started thinking, what if I could use one of those windows as my debugging view, while the other acts as a regular play view? And what if I could embed both of them into the editor window? Alright, now we're cooking. I just have to completely refactor how the game view works so that it can pick a specific window to embed and be instanced twice in one panel. No big deal. Well, maybe we should start small and just look at the window selector. Creating the UI elements here for the drop-down selector is relatively easy, but coming up with a way for the embedding system to embed different windows is a bit more challenging. Any problem becomes easier though when you break it up into multiple parts. So that's what I did. I modified the window creation code so that sub-windows could be spawned with a parent window, I edited the embedding system so that it can check for a specific window name when attempting to embed. I added a new parameter to the Godot core, which tells the built game that it should spawn a named subwindow with a parent instead of free floating. With all that in place, you could then pick between the main window and a custom window to use for embedding. This is done by inputting the name of the desired custom window, which will be passed to the built game as a parameter. I believe this is pretty helpful all on its own and we haven't even touched debugging yet. Users with multi-game windows are no longer forced to just have the main window in the game view and have more control and choice over what gets embedded. But the work wasn't done. I considered leaving that as its own PR, but thanks to suggestions from an expert contributor named Hilderin, who pioneered a lot of display server code in the first place, it seemed better to have everything in place together so that people can see the full idea in action. This created a lot of code for the PR, but was a necessary evil and something that had to be done eventually, so it was good to get it out of the way. Tackling the dual view was no small feat, but after reworking the game view so that more of its features were managed by the instance itself, and moving some global features out to the game tab as a whole, I was able to spawn two of those bad boys and split them with a draggable UI element. I added a selector to turn on or off the dual view, and a lot of additional logic to handle edge cases. And finally, I had my PR. And just look at that. I can actually play the game and see it in action from a different view. It was a lot of work, both more and less than I expected, and I hit a lot of roadblocks along the way, but it's functional, and it sets up an excellent path for easier debugging in the future. So that's great, but it's a little misleading to say that this fully addresses what I set out to do. For one, the secondary view is a bit of a trick. I had to create a sub-window in the game and set up a camera there to get this perspective. It would be really neat if this whole process was automatic. Like for example, if I just press play and the game automatically created a debugging window with the camera override enabled so that I don't have to worry about managing it within my hierarchy. And actually, the debugging tools just flat out don't work for the secondary view because they're only set up to handle one view. Ideally, both game views would have debugging parity and can independently toggle camera override, input, and so on, but the current system makes a lot of assumptions that were too complicated to work with for now. To really accomplish this in the future, we'd need to use either two copies of the runtime debugger, though it's currently a singleton, or we'd have to send the desired window data through the debugging signals so that it knows which window to act on. For now though, I thought this was a good stopping point before the PR becomes way too bloated and too difficult to review. In the future, I've definitely got solid ideas on how to fully realize this stuff, but at this stage it seems prudent to wait until the implementation has been accepted and merged. On that subject, I finished this thing back in March, so I've been waiting a while to see some traction on it. 
I'm sure the maintainers have been pretty busy with other things, and this may not be their highest priority, but in all honesty, it's been somewhat difficult to keep the code up to date. It's a huge PR, which means conflicts pop up all the time, which I try to keep up with, but it's becoming a larger effort to keep it current and ready to merge. I should also mention that since creating the pull request, another contributor named Jaden forked the branch and found a clean way to create an alternate view where you get the panels side by side instead of top and bottom. I like this idea a lot, and it was really cool to see. So with his permission, I merged in the changes and added him as a co-author to the commit. Huge thanks for this awesome contribution, especially since it gets us thinking about further customization options in the future. But we seem to have missed the window to get all this in for 4.5. Now that we're out of feature freeze and developing new features for 4.6, with any luck, it might just pave the way for the future of debugging in Godot. So I don't want to get anyone's hopes up. It's not confirmed that it will be merged, and this is just my take on this kind of feature, which could be completely discarded a month from now. But I'm hoping it sets us down a good path that improves the debugging experience for all Godot developers. If you like what you see, I'll put a link to the pull request down in the description below, and you can feel free to give it some support on GitHub. Emoji reactions are welcome. Godot developers love them, and I kind of do too. If you liked the video, feel free to subscribe, and oh, do check out my latest game, Burden of Truth, if it looks interesting. I've been a bit slow to upload because I was bogged down in work on that massive project, but I'm excited to kind of give back to the community a bit and create more educational videos on game development topics like this one. Alright, that's all for me, so stay safe and thanks for playing.